That seven filet all day. Come on, the cockle van are dying in the past. Hands, I need hands. We're 86ing the corn dogs. Oh no, we're not opening a restaurant, are we? Don't look at me. This, this is, is a hot dog, dog is, is a sandwich. sandwich. Ketchup is a smoothie. Yeah, I put ice in my cereal, so what? That makes no sense. A hot dog is a sandwich. A hot dog is a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> what? Welcome to our podcast, A Hot Dog is a Sandwich. I'm your host, Josh Sher. And I'm your host, Nicole Inaiti. And today we are joined by Robert Irvine. Everyone, yeah! Robert! 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 The second Buffett chef in this room right now. <laughs> oh, don't no! hurt me, don't hurt me. Oh, my oh God. no! Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm the first He one. said the second? <laughs> I'm the strongest. I'm sorry. I'm the I overcompensate. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> That's okay. We can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> right, so Robert, of course, is a world-class chef, entrepreneur, and Food Network host of Restaurant Impossible, among other shows. He's a multi-time author, and you can buy his newest book, Overcoming Impossible, Learn to Lead, Build a Team, and Catapult Your Business to Success. He also may or may not be my biological father. <laughs> uh, Robert, would you I be thought we weren't going to talk about that. We-, I, we have a paternity test. You thought it was a COVID test? That was actually... <laughs> Normally, you don't it was be in positive. <laughs> oh my god, my long lost son! Eat more. It's like the Mario <laughs> show. It's no. great. He's already tried you to feed me. You are the me. father. <laughs> <laughs> Mazel tov. I want to know who the mother is. <laughs> I think that means I'm not Jewish. Ah, we'll figure it we'll out. We'll figure later. it out later. It's okay. I've already been sacrificed. Anyways, Robert, so <laughs> what we wanted to talk to you about. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. The morality clause is going to be fun. We wanted to ask you whether or not we should open a restaurant because we have a very, I don't know if you've heard of it, a very strong digital media brand. We have a lot of fans out there who always say you should open a restaurant. We wanted to ask you whether or not it would be a good idea. All right. So let's go a couple of questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Do you have $2 million in a bank? Nicole, how much money you got? Um, Not that. Are your student loans paid off yet? Absolutely not. (laughs) Okay. So $2 million. Then your expending or your expected revenue so for six months, you expect to do a million. Mm. You need that at a bank. Then you need an O-S-H-I-T fund <laughs> okay. in case something goes wrong. Mm. And normally when you go into a restaurant, the hood system breaks, the refrigeration mm-hmm. breaks, the oven breaks, and it's O-S-H-I-T moments, right? So the answer to me would be no. <laughs> but we okay. wrote a pitch and everything. Yeah, hear us out, hear us we out. Did. because. We we have some connections here, right? So we know two guys who own a relatively successful digital media company. Mm-hmm. Their names are Rhett and Link. We call and them if, Daddy Rhett. We call Daddy. them Daddy Rhett and Daddy Link. So I'm not going to ask why. Well, if, if they if they were able to say invest a million dollars each, and we were able to do this, you know, we we have a whole business plan, mm-hmm. and we actually do get that initial seed capital. Do you think, like, say okay, we found so a nice restaurant? Okay, so let me give you space. another statistic. Okay. okay. Uh-huh. So if you you make one point two million dollars in revenue, you're lucky to walk away with ninety thousand dollars a year. If you're willing to work ninety hours a week mm. for ninety thousand dollars a year, mm. go for it. <laughs> but I will guarantee you'll be calling me in a couple of months saying, Robert, it's not working. <laughs> because that's exactly what happens. Somebody says, Oh, we got investors, or we got credit cards. Mm. My mom says I make the best sauce and the best gravy and the best meatballs. I should open a restaurant. <laughs> And they do. The biggest failing restaurant in the United States is an Italian restaurant, hands down. Wow. Because everybody wants to make mama's meatballs. That's Rocco. Uh, Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's a true statement. Yeah. So you open the restaurant. It's gun-ho for the first six months. You bring all your friends in. Oh, rah, 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 (laughs) rah. And then six months later, you got no money. Yeah. And that's that's normally what happens on Restaurant Impossible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Of course. And we've done 300... 40, 350, whatever the number is now. And it's the same story. And I hear it all the time. Look, if you want to go for work for somebody and really understand what the restaurant business, not just food, because anybody can cook. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I can cook, you can cook. <laughs> but it's understanding the financial obligations that you have and how to control costs. Of mm-hmm. course. If you can control costs and go from one mythical kitchen to two to three to four, if you get 10, and the purchase power is big, mm-hmm. and somebody comes in and says, oh, I like this concept, let's open 30 of them, that's where you make money. That's yeah, a $300 that's million right. dollar company. That's right. That's interesting. Franchising. What percentage of opening a restaurant and it being successful actually has to do with you being able to cook good food? <laughs> zero. Like, really? Full yeah, on zero? Yeah. Yeah. Because, because I, I could hire you, mm-hmm. who is a great chef, and, and look, I'm a good cook. Yeah. I hire yeah. people way smarter than me. Yeah, right on. They cook. I make money. I'm really good at it. Yeah. But you don't have to be the cook. 
you have to be the the vision of that and the leader of that. And the, the biggest failure in restaurants is lack of leadership, mm. lack of vision, For and then sure. holding people accountable. Because they're like, oh, I mean, I just did one. Oh, the, the filing cabinet was a garbage bag full of paper. Uh, gosh. <laughs> and then he's wondering why they're $450,000 in debt. Yeah. That's so look, if you've got the training and somebody can help you walk through it, mm-hmm. you've got a strong enough brand to be able to bring people to it and franchise. I'm a big believer in franchise sure. because you're taking a cut and somebody else is doing it work. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, okay. So so let's actually game plan this out, right? So us actually, Nicole and I being the executive chefs, co-executive chefs, which one, leadership vacuum, we would be dead already. But two, <laughs> say that instead of us going out and actually finding the real estate building out a restaurant ourselves, training the staff ourselves, say we did some sort of a licensing deal, right? Hmm. Or say there's a company that, you know, they control the real estate and they're building out, say, a uh, fast casual sort of food hall situation. They want to slap the mythical kitchen name on it. We can take some of our best dishes, our most proprietary inventions. You've never had orange chicken Parmesan, have you? It's a combination of orange chicken no. and chicken parmesan. What, no. What about? I'm so excited. What about <laughs> popcorn ice cream cake? Doesn't that that's sound a, yeah. good? Yeah. Ooh. That's, a good, that's yeah. good stuff. Yeah, Toppy. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> what about beef bile cheesecake? Now, I understand that beef bile might be a little bit polarizing. Mm-hmm. But the whole brand of Mythical is, you know, making people try new things. And, you know, sometimes you might need a barf bucket on the side. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, you know, you might eat the most delicious thing. It's all about highs and lows of the Mythical kitchen. Which, you look dubious. <laughs> what you're saying is. So far, you just discussed <laughs> <laughs> a lot of lows and a bath bucket. But uh, it got a visceral reaction from you, Robert. And I think did. that's what we're that's really important. trying to create with the Mythical Kitchen that's restaurant right, experience. Right. It's something unique. Yes. My God, you'll be closed in three minutes. <laughs> bath yeah. buckets at the table <laughs> during barbecue bile season. Well, it's like how you go to a Joe's Crab Shack and they have the, the bucket for the crab for shells. The crab- yep. uh-huh, We'd have uh-huh. that for vomit. <laughs> All, right, All right. So look. On a scale of one to ten, that's an eleven. No, we're deleting that from the rest. Okay, delete it, delete it, delete it. That's completely deleted. (laughs) But for real, like you've, I mean, obviously you have worked with the Food Network for a long time. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of chefs from Food Network, yourself included, who it's like your name will be on the restaurant. Obviously, you are not the person who's there cooking every day, but you're using a brand power that you built over for blood, sweat, tears over years. I'm going to correct you slightly different because there are two ways to do this, right? Mm -hmm. So I can either use my name and my likeness Mm -hmm. um, to sell, which is normally a 7% royalty, or I own it. So we own Mm -hmm. most of our stuff. So our manufacturing plants, our distilleries, we own it simply because – I can control it then. If I if, if I license my name to you, mm-hmm. yes, I can put an executive chef in like we do in Vegas who controls my piece of that. In mm-hmm. other words, the food, the quality, et cetera, the systems. But nine out of ten times, yeah, Guy Fieri has 500 restaurants. He's not in yeah, on a cruise yeah. ship because yeah. <laughs> he's filming TV. There's different ways to, to create revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, I chose to fund – Fit Crunch and all the other things that we do, I fund that my, myself. Wow. I don't have partners. You don't have any partners. No. That was for all. You. So, Not so, God, girl. so for me, um, it works. Yeah. Otherwise, I've got to deal with bath buckets, you know, not <laughs> eating. You're not feeling good about yourself. Yeah. I'm not coming in today, you know. Mm. So it's much easier to control the, the avenue or, or the direction if you own the manufacturing uh, and the product itself. Yeah. Do you see more people getting into hot water from trying to own everything themselves or from taking on extra partners and investors? I think it's more – look, there's no saying, right? <laughs> the more cooks in the kitchen mm-hmm. spoil the broth. Sure. The mm-hmm. more partners you have, the more say they have, the more messed up it gets, in my mm-hmm. opinion, right? Yeah. Unless you are the expert. Mm-hmm. So we have technology. We have clothing. We have nutrition. We have food. We have um, – and if we don't have the, the knowledge, we bring the knowledge in to support it. Mm-hmm. That way, you know, hey, we're paying you a salary. But mm-hmm. if we get to this point, then there's a percentage of that revenue that you can garner based on your knowledge. So I think it's surrounding yourself with good people. Sure. Yeah. 
That's important. That's so important. say say you don't have two million. You surrounded dollars. yourself with good people. We have good people. I yeah. feel very surrounded by likewise, good people right likewise. here. Likewise, <laughs> uh, but I mean that that's what does give us you know a little bit of hope for at least the mythical kitchen. This is more of a thought exercise right of now. Of course, but of yeah. course this is something that people throw out the idea. And of course, the worst reason to open a restaurant is people telling to you make, you should open a restaurant or to make money or to make money. <laughs> yeah. But say you don't have two million dollars in the bank. What about the idea? I'm thinking of a guy like Roy Choi yeah. who started a food truck and That's then right. was able to very organically build a brand over time and time and time. And God, he's 14 years now Cinderella since the story. launch yeah. of the Kogi food trucks. But that also kicked off a wave of a lot of failed food trucks. Absolutely. You know? But but here's the thing. Think of a food truck. The Army's just done it now. The Army bought five, five food trucks. No not way. Because, not because – it's a food truck fad. It's because people can get from point A to point B sure. to get mm-hmm. food. Right. Yeah. Uh, food trucks are a great, in my opinion, and it's a humble opinion, are a great way to learn business. Mm-hmm. There's a program mm-hmm. for veterans right now called Chow, where we put you in a, in, a, in a food truck. We train you how to run a food truck. We train you how to do financials. And then we put you in brick and mortar. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. That's so, so wonderful. So the, it's, I, I think it's the quickest way to your own business because, hey, look, you can up and move, number mm, one, if sure. your business isn't good. Mm-hmm. But it also gives you the education of, all right, what are the people asking for? Yeah. Because you can change your menu. Look, if, if you have brick and mortar, yeah, you can change your menu. It takes forever to change your menu because <laughs> you have a guaranteed uh, influx of guests. Mm. Sure. A food truck, you move it, it's all new. Yeah. So you can you can really adapt and re- reinvent yourself every week, every couple of days. It's the quickest way. You, you buy a food truck, you do it up. You make your money and so on and so on. And I've done food truck shows. It's a great way to, to, to get into that business world. And yes, it's not fast. Fit Crunch took me eight years to build. Did it really? Incredible. Eight years. That's so interesting because I, I, even though you think that I don't eat, I do think that I eat a lot. <laughs> and I do eat a lot of protein bars. And we won't say for, okay, we'll keep it on the dumbbell. <laughs> Fit Crunch was something where, and I guess this is a testament to how brands build. I had never seen it before, and then one day I was in the Costco, and I saw it in the Costco, and I was like, oh, damn, Robert Irvine has protein bars. Yeah. But there must have been so, so much work and time before it actually crossed my eyeballs. Literally five years of, you know, there are 231 protein bars in this country. Jeez. Right? We're number Oof. four, I think, or number five now. Wow. After eight years. Yeah. But it's, it's creating a product, and, and look, your name will only get you so far. Mm-hmm. It's the product – that they eat, that they come back for, they don't. Um, and most protein bars, you know, you used to lift. <laughs> oh my gosh! I, ouch! Can I, ouch. Can I say something? What's up, Josh? I tried to, I tr- this is embarrassing, I tried to get a pump before this. I was in the gym literally until we arrived here. Because I was like, Robert Irvine, I know, this is all I get. Josh, I'm proud this of you. This is all I get. You I'm, look good, dude. You look great. I've deloaded off the creatine. Great, I've been sick for two weeks. My knee hurts. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I want to hear more about, like, this. this C- aside from restaurants, like, CPG is just so interesting. Like, the whole world and just the, the testing and the QC is just exhausting. It is. But once you get it and you harness that, like, almost like grabbing the golden snitch, mm-hmm. it is truly, it, like, you have, to, you have to come up with something that's so unique. So that's why right. do we go into protein bars? Because my kids wouldn't eat breakfast. So oh. I'm like, oh, let's give them something to take. To. Because about 10 o'clock, they all dive. Mm. Yeah. They're not interested. <laughs> and we started it. We baked We baked the cookie. It's the only baked bar for a reason. Mm. And they said, oh, it's never going to work, never going to work. I mean, I schlopped myself after TV shows to Costco and all these other places. We didn't even have a package. It was in a silver foil sure. thing. Yeah. Uh, and here we are now, you know, a couple hundred million dollars later. Mm. And, you know, that's the way you build a brand. People think that it comes overnight. It doesn't. It's not. Mm. It takes forever. I finished telling some folks last night. You finish a TV show, you go and you say, hey, please, sir. Can you try my bar? <laughs> or please, sir, can you try my food? Or please, yeah. sir, can, you know, yeah. whatever it is. And eventually something clicks, but but too many people give up too fast mm. because it costs time and money. Sure, sure. Of course. Yeah, the- but, and the mythical kitchen is great, but then then come up with a concept that's franchisable mm. that there's some wacky food, of course, because that makes it fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's also food that people can go in there daily and get. Yeah, that they know. Oh, oh, I'm gonna go there because look, an average franchise restaurant. Think about it. Um, McDonald's for a franchise is 1.9 million dollars. Dang. Yeah. Yeah. For a burger joint. It's a lot of cash. 
Let's kick ass. I, love it. <laughs> I mean, hello, but you guaranteed two million dollars back. Yeah. So you you pay for yourself in the first year. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it really is. What makes you different, and why are people going to go there? And what's fun about it, especially young people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're the future. I mean. I'm curious what you've seen from, say, like the young chefs in the industry. I know you've shot with guys like Nick DiGiovanni yep. before, but sure, there's yeah. there's a lot of these young chefs. Where well, I'm I'm 30, she's I'm hurtling towards it. Well, let's say <laughs> oh people like God. at us and below. Yeah, my grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, where do you see this generation going in terms of entrepreneurship? What have you already seen out there? Does it excite you or? But I think you look at look at where we are now. Look at what you're doing. Okay. Mm. This is entrepreneurship, right? Uh, uh, Nick, Nick is a great. I remember doing a, a thing in Miami with him and a Fit Crunch bar and a, and a, a, a bowl of Nutella uh-huh. and a knife. <laughs> I mean, he gets you know twenty four million hits or whatever, uh, and people go and buy this product. Yeah, and I think that's great for him. He's making X amount of money. I'm not that good at that. I'm old school. I'm like, mm. oh, yeah, chop the <laughs> like yes, you know. Yeah. I think the younger generation wants something fast. Um, which is why Mythical Kitchen has to be, if I look at Taco Bell, 34 seconds to put a product out of a window. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 34 yeah. seconds. Because we're instant gratification. Mm-hmm. We don't sure. want we don't want to sit down and and like forever yeah. young people just want to get in get out and get on with life and i think that's the the difference between the Knicks uh and and you guys is hey we're bringing it to you whether you like it or not you're breaking mm-hmm. the that's mold right. of traditional tv and 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 uh technology yeah which i love by the way yeah thank you that's <laughs> i do i no, do truly. i think thank it's you. it's the future gone are the big days where we got to go into a studio and you know i did a i did a show uh, four years ago, traveling the globe, looking mm-hmm. at, at salt and oils and vinegars and from literally Sri Lanka, cinnamon, with with a camera, uh, two guys. Mm-hmm. And it was unbelievable. I'm sure. And that's and I think that's the future of, you know, restaurants. What what titillates us, titillates us right? Yeah. What, we, why do we go in there? Is it because we get on the internet? Is it because we can do this? Is it because there's so much going on that it's mesmerizing? Yeah. yeah. And then the food comes. I think he's talking about the Rainforest Cafe. Oh, yeah. I would love to be a part of that franchising kind of deal. (laughs) Why? We know him. I know the guy who developed it. I just, I just, listen. Okay. So when I was, my parents used to go to, yeah, when I was 12, (laughs) my parents used to go to Vegas every single, I don't know, Thanksgiving or so. And they would always take me to Rainforest Cafe because whenever the lights would turn off and then the the thunder would go off and the gorillas were in the corner, like, ooh, I would just freak out. And I loved it to this day. I will go to Rainforest Cafe. Just well, do you know how that started, that right? No, I don't. So, Justin, what was the name of the guy? I forgot his name. Stephen Shustler. Stephen Shustler. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Stephen Thanks. Shustler, right? He he had this idea of the Rainforest Cafe, and he turned his apartment, that was no bigger than this, into a Rainforest Cafe to bring people. Are you kidding True story. Me? Absolutely true story. And he brought the investors, and, and he had the parakeets going, <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> And that's how he sold Rainforest Cafe. Unreal. No and, way. And, and I know Stephen very well. He has a um, uh, in Minneapolis. He has what is tantamount to a museum. He bought two two uh, containers full of broken pieces. Mm-hmm. Right. Let me explain that in a second. And he just paid sixty thousand dollars per container. Mm-hmm. And. He had a guy over 24 years take all those pieces. He now has like 20 Ming Dynasty full size in in a warehouse (laughs) protected by the FBI in Minneapolis. Shut up. I'm not kidding. And this one guy, piece by piece, is unbelievable. And that's, this is the guy. That's the kind of guy he is, yeah. The boathouse in in Orlando. Oh, my God. A big hit, $28 million a year plus. And and he is this visionary that, that... Almost, um, I don't know, like wacko, right? Because I think you need to be a little little bit to be be able to get to that point. But there's a guy I met, and I was like, my God, this guy's really (laughs) But he's a he's a genius. Yeah. So while you love Rainforest Cafe, the boathouse in Orlando, he did the same thing there. He put these vintage cars that drive into the water. You know, they're, they're, they're duck boats or whatever they call mm-hmm. but not duck boats as we know them. Mm-hmm. They're real cars 
that were fitted with propellers and you get in, you drive around, then you go in the water and try. It's like a fantasy it's, builder. It's crazy. Yeah. He's a fantasy world builder. But, but but I feel that's the entrepreneurship of, of young people. Yes. Mm-hmm. We're thinking out the box now. Yeah. You're tapping into the psychology of what people want and where the white space is. Yeah. Like e- even if you look at Fit Crunch, so I've, I've eaten countless protein bars, believe it or not, <laughs> in my life. But for me, no way. <laughs> yeah, I've, se- I've seen the industry change myself. Like, there seems to be an industry standard right now. I blame Quest, no. right? So Quest right now, the industry standard, you have Quest, you have Think, you have another couple bars, okay. uh, Pure Protein. They've sure. all boiled it down to 200 calories per 20 grams of protein. Yep. And they didn't used to have those macros. They used mm. to be a lot more in the in the 300 gram range. Why is that? And then because a lot of people are focused on weight mm. loss, right? Oh, okay. And so, but then you have the opposite side, which is this very hyper masculine metrics, big crunch, 100, yeah, 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 which yeah. are delicious. They're about 450 calories. The one with the, the tiger on it. Of protein. I don't know if there's no. That's no tiger's milk bars. That's a candy bar. Oh, um, but like there's you know these things, Close. and then. <laughs> Good research. <laughs> it was either like this very, and it was a more feminine branded for weight loss protein mm-hmm. bar or a hyper masculine. Interesting. This is for bulk monsters. And here I am in the middle going, I just want something that tastes good. And I yeah. see Fit Crunch in Costco. Yeah. And it says baked and it has, you know, a reputable jacked chef on it. And I'm like, this is where I'm <laughs> at right that's now. You. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it's funny, it's it, but it's funny because we we've extended their brand now because them them masculine guys that want to mm-hmm. look huge. Mm-hmm. I didn't want that. I wanted the mums, the dads, the grandmas, the grandma yeah. uh, parts to eat that. We're going into minis. We're going into cookies now. We're mm-hmm. going into right RTDs. Which the cookie are bars amazing, are amazing, right? Yeah. So and and trail mixes, things mm-hmm. like that. Right on. The extensions of the brands. But again, listening to what you want yeah. for your lifestyle. And I think that's the same with restaurants. Look, I go into mm-hmm. a restaurant every week and, and I sit down and I go, your food sucks, you suck, <laughs> uh, your leadership sucks, the place sucks. And they just break down, which is normal <laughs> when somebody tells you you suck at everything. Yeah. And then we, we build them up. But I have to look at the skill level in the kitchen, the skill level around the area. What are what are the businesses? You know, is there a mythical kitchen? Is there a mm-hmm. right? Where is the where are the young people going? Yeah, because I've got to make that. It may be there forty years and grandma's meatballs, mm-hmm. right? And um, how do we how do we bring that into the twenty second century? Mm-hmm. Because you can do you can do three million dollars in a five hundred square foot. Um, open kitchen. Yep. Yeah. Believe me, I've seen it. Um, uh, it's, I think it's a fun game to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, food, nutrition, health style, hair, I mean, <laughs> clothing, <laughs> yeah, because that's what we do every day, right? Sure. Yeah. It's, it's part of do. life. What, what have you seen the trends right now where the restaurant industry is going? Like if you were to open up, like don't release any proprietary information, but if you were to open up a new <laughs> concept from scratch right now, what kind of food are you serving and, and what's the medium? Everything is fresh. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I uh, we have one in the Pentacle. I, I don't mind telling you, you can't get in it, but <laughs> it's called Fresh Kitchen. Um, and it literally is scratch cooking from uh, in, in in a in an environment where we have 38,000 people go through mm-hmm. that building. That's every incredible. Day. They don't always go through the restaurant, but sure. 38,000 people sure. in, that, in that building. And I think if we take that and move that out into the real world, which we're, we're doing right now, um, it will be a huge hit because you want something. First, first of all, time is of the essence. Mm. Of course. You want to walk in. You want to pick it up. Yep. You eat it on the go or you eat it at your desk. I don't want to wait. So I think speed to service, technology is changing that so fast mm-hmm. now. Not only think about computers, but think about going to a football stadium that's got 17 different uh, restaurants in it, and you can go up to a place and go bum 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 bum. Just put your scan wrist. it, yeah. Pay it, and yeah. it comes to you. It's happening now. It's it's supermarkets, the checkouts, all those kind of things. Mm. I think our 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 food system will change dramatically from you preparing it mm-hmm. from from the Publix and the WalMarts and all these, and instead it will be ready prepared. It will be look. You've got um, you got fish, you got chicken, you got this in a thing, you'll drop it in, in a, a thing of water and you'll eat it. It'll have all the nutrition's uh, uh, nutrients that you need for a healthy lifestyle. It's going that way. Sous vide, quote, unquote, <laughs> I call it boiling in the bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But it's the same thing. It's happening. We mm-hmm. see that mm-hmm. now. You know, for, for a resilient soldier, sailor, airman, whatever, mm-hmm. and they're the biggest uh, 
purchaser of food in the world, the military. Yeah. Think about Makes this. Makes sense. I mean, it's exciting for me because we're all involved in it. Yeah. That's it. Do you, <laughs> do, you, do you see that future, though, in which people are relying less and less on their own home cooking as a good thing? Or do you think that skill loss is just inevitable and we just need I to think we, react we, to we, it? Again, I go back to the younger generation. Look, mm-hmm. I was taught to cook because I had to cook because my mother was a terrible cook. Yeah. yeah, yeah right? So mm-hmm. you survive. Now, you can go anywhere. You can go to a Wawa, put it in. You go to a 7-Eleven. Mm-hmm. You go anywhere. And you don't have to cook. Because your time is more important doing other things. And I think the priority-driven youth is like, look, if I spend 20 minutes doing this as opposed to this, I can make that much money. Productivity. Right. Yep. And I'm a a big watcher of that. So I think food's going to change. We're going to have prepared food in in very different ways. In China and Japan, there are food courts like this, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. automated, Everything is fresh. They make your pizza in 90 seconds and make you a yeah. salad the way so you want. So cool. It. It's crazy. <laughs> but you don't need people. And and that's our mm. biggest thing right that's now our is people. Thing, yeah. yeah. We don't have Work. that skilled labor. Yeah. That's interesting. I am um, I think people don't recognize the opportunity cost. Back to our fans telling us we should cuz we, we just really wanted to dispel the myth that we could open a restaurant because we can't. <laughs> Uh, and everybody asks us That's why true. we don't do it, and it's because the opportunity cost. We are very good at making media, and the only reason we're good at it is because we've been doing it for several, That's several right. years. We've gradually refined our process, right? We started out making one video a week. That mm-hmm. went up to two. That's going up to three eventually. Woo-hoo! Wink, wink. Now the podcast is on a full video. The mm-hmm. podcast is streamed across Spotify and Apple onto YouTube. All those metrics are tracked. We sell ad deals across five different platforms. Short form content. Short form content. <laughs> yeah, like we, we use that a as a deal sweetener to sure. work with big brands. But the point is, we're very good at doing this. We're not good yeah. at opening restaurants. Uh-uh. Yeah. And Nuh-uh. that's the thing. The the biggest like predicator of skill is, have you done it and have you done it successfully? Yeah. And I don't think people recognize that. They're just like, open it. But, we'll but come. you can take one and you can cultivate it and learn from it mm-hmm. uh, before you franchise it. And look, Robert Earl did that with with uh, Planet uh, Planet Hollywood. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he did the same thing. Oh, let's open a thing with a bunch of guys, put some jackets on the wall. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he's still going by it. Very eccentric guy. He's a great guy. <laughs> Another eccentric guy, yeah. Uh, he's yeah, yeah. a great guy. <laughs> but, you know, at his heyday, they were making hundreds of millions of dollars. That's right. Yeah. Celebrities just walking through. Yeah, yeah. 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 Slice alone. No, let me just put my jacket up. There, yeah, or, you know. So I think th- there's definitely a um, you have a following mm. that Which could be nice. curtailed into a small, you know, even an airport restaurant, right? Burbank Airport, right next to an Gaffietti. airport to start it, where where or, or do a pop up. We yeah. did a we did a hot dog pop up, mm-hmm. and it was really fun. It was really fun. We kicked ass. Moved about what five hundred hot dogs in like what like a day? Less than I mean it was like it was like what four hours? It's like five hundred like hot it was dogs. Maggie was like Worked six with, hours. Uh, partnered with the local Venezuelan yeah. hot dog vendor. Yeah. Shout out Gerardo. I hope you're watching. Hey. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was our first kind of foray into it, just to test like, hey, how can we actually do this? But uh. Yeah, but it's no different to when you started this, right? One video, two video. Yeah, of course. It's it's a process of learning the system, putting a system in place, and everybody follows that system. Mm -hmm. Then it grows. We did the same thing with Fit Crunch. No, I mean, hey, taste the bar, taste the bar, taste the bar, taste the bar. Mm. It cost me more money to taste the bar than I was making. Sure, but but you got to get the name out there. The minute you get the name out there, it goes. One of my biggest questions is. Because there's the idea of the sunk cost fallacy, right? Uh-huh. People who say, well, I've already spent so much money on these sample bars and I should just quit because I've sunk money into mm-hmm. it and I can't get that back. How do you know when to give up? I don't think there's ever a, a give up point. I think, look, you've spent your $100,000 minimum run or whatever it is of your bars. You give them mm-hmm. out. It takes one person to say, oh, you know what? I really like that bar. The problem is when you send the bars out, we forget about it, right? We, nobody yeah. ever follows up. Instead <laughs> yeah. of saying, hey, by the way, Josh, can you – did you like that? Oh, yeah. Here's $3 million. Go and buy – make more. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Right? And yeah. they're out there. People are out there. People want to invest in small business because it's a quick return for them if it's the good – if it's the mm-hmm. right business, yes. right? Um, I do that every week. I invest in lots of stuff because I see the future of a technology in our world, point of sales systems, mm-hmm. inventory control systems, all those kind of things. Yeah. 
Well, Robert, you said you invest in small businesses. We have an idea for you. That's so right. what it is, it's called the mythical kitchen. We have a vomit bucket at every table. Yes. I know you didn't like that idea, but I think yeah. that's really core to our business model. But mm-hmm. it's also a food truck. What? Did you just add that in without we, asking me? Nicole, I'm sorry. Josh, Listen, it's a business. No, I just, we You're can my take partner it from A to B. I don't know how we to can't drive. Just say food truck at- my driver's license was revoked. So you have to drive. I don't want to drive. I don't like driving you don't in regular have an life. Option. I don't, Han has had to I'm, do I'm hiring a driver. I think we should just keep doing the videos. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do. Yeah, what? I'll give you a, I'll give you a challenge. I'll do a mm-hmm. pop-up restaurant with you. <laughs> okay. Right? And all mm-hmm. the proceeds keep talking. all the proceeds yeah. after the cost of doing it go to the Robert Irvine Foundation. I'm in on it. You right. got to shake Nicole's hand at the same oh, time. This is same how it time, works. Same time. So you give me this. No. No, you got to cross got, it. And then okay. I know the left hand doesn't really count. This is a, this is a legal binding right. contract. This is like. Wait, Jesse, get the shot. Get the take shot. Take a picture. Take a picture. I got to flex. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Josh and I strive to do everything we can to keep our cats healthy, and we can see the benefits in our fur baby's overall happiness. Yeah, but since we're not mind readers, we don't always know when our cats are healthy. Helping us know that our cats are healthy is just one reason to go with Pretty Litter. Pretty Litter is its own little health detector. The litter changes colors to help detect early signs of potential illness in our cats, including urinary tract infections and kidney issues. This helps give us peace of mind with our cat's health. It's got ultra-absorbent crystals that trap odor instantly and minimize mess and dust. No more cat bathroom smell. And these crystals last up to a month, which means less scooping and fewer trips to the garbage can. It makes me feel like I'm doing that little extra step in being a really, really good cat mom. Listen, I want to be the best cat parent that I can, but I'm not going to lie. I love the fact that I just don't smell my cat's pee-pee in the apartment anymore. Pretty Litter is also super convenient since it ships free to my door in a small lightweight bag. I never run out of it, and I don't have a huge container of litter taking up space and stinking up the place. Pretty Litter helps keep my cats healthy and keeps odors down. You and your cat are going to love Pretty Litter as much as we do. Go to prettylitter.com slash hot dog to save 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com slash hot dog to save 20%. Prettylitter.com slash hot dog. Between the podcast and our Mythical Kitchen YouTube videos, we've been keeping busy, but Daily Harvest helps with stress-free meals delivered to our door. Daily Harvest works directly with farmers so they can send you harvest bowls, smoothies, and more built on organic fruits and vegetables and more of the best ingredients around. I love their flatbreads, and they have a bunch of options from artichoke and spinach to portobello and pesto. Their flatbreads are made from 100% real fruits and veggies. They've got a crispy crust and piled high toppings, so they're good any way you slice them. Daily Harvest meals are freezer fresh, so everything stays fresh in my freezer until I'm ready to enjoy it, helping me reduce food waste and easily prepare my meals. Triangles. You like to cut them in triangles? Yeah, just, I don't know. It kind of makes me feel like I'm at the pizza parlor. Anyways, they're committed to human and planetary health as well, which is rad. Daily Harvest does their absolute best to ensure transparency and integrity when it comes to their ingredients and the humans who grow them. Daily Harvest supports farmers who invest in good practices for biodiversity and soil health. I don't like when people do squares. It's like, what are you, you, Chicago? Let Daily Harvest do more so you can do less. Go to dailyharvest.com slash hot dog to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash hot dog for up to $40 off your first box. Dailyharvest.com slash hot dog. I mean, slice it any way you want. It's just triangles are correct. All right, Nicole and Robert, we've heard what you and I have to say. Now it's time to find out what other wacky ideas are rattling out there in the universe. It's time for a segment we call Opinions Are Like Casseroles. Uh, Also, we got a new Mythical Society app out there. That's right. There's a new look. There's new features. There's even a whole new dang website. It is available for everybody. Download it for free on the App Store or Google Play Store. Robert, have you downloaded the Mythical Society app? Justin did. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Justin. MVP. Justin is my right and left hand guy. Oh, what a cutie. (laughs) Yeah. And he's sleeping. (laughs) Let's listen to some voicemails. Justin, wake up. (laughs) It's Peter from Chicagoland and... Frankly, I'm an ideas man and not a logistics man, so (laughs) every restaurant should have free samples, like a Baskin-Robbins where you can try the ice cream. I don't know how it's going to work, but look, (laughs) there's enough food waste. I'm sure there's little bits left off of plates. Just give me a free sample of that if I want to, like, I'm I'm, going (laughs) to eat there, but I want to know what I'm eating first. 
Also, if somebody sends a dish back, I should be able to claim it for my table. I agree with that. Oh, okay. Robert, what do you think? Free samples? Free samples of what? The whole menu before you choose? (laughs) What are you, crazy? I think you get like you get to try two things, like Baskin Robbins. Like oh, you know, you're it's in, only allowed two you samples. Get two samples, and then you're just an a hole because you're you're holding up the line. They get two things. Yeah, you're but like, it's different in a restaurant. Is to an ice cream shop. You go sure. in, you scoop it, you suck it, you eat it. Right? We got to cook it. That's right. You can't just like you make can't just, a thousand mini meatballs. No, this guy. Just, he wants to have Tupperwares filled with like duck. Mashed potatoes yeah. and the sauce, and then you give them little spoonfuls, and you have to hand feed. They're like, "Here you go, here you go." Yeah. Yeah. hand feeds. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Yeah, exactly, food. exactly. Um, yeah. Okay, so there is really quick a story I want to talk about that is in this vein. Um, there is a local tamalera, a lady who sold tamales outside of a Trader Joe's I've in Los Angeles. This. You see the story? Yes, I've seen. And it. she went to the Trader Joe's and saw them giving out free samples, and she's like. I should do this with my tamales. Oh my! And so she made tiny little mm. corn husk tamales, wrapped them up. They are freaking adorable. And they're samples. And the journalist, friend of the show, Memo Torres from LA Taco, yeah. wrote about them. And this thing went viral, viral, and she blew up. So, you know, there's there's a little bit of merit. I'm just saying, Robert. Little there is, but there is, but but when you when you're when you're a one stop shop tamales, okay? Yeah. Fit, three right. different tamales yeah, yeah. is great. Here you can do that. Um, you can do it with a bar, right? You can cut a piece up, mm-hmm. you can taste it. Mm-hmm. Do it with vodka and gin and all those things that we do. But but a restaurant that has 27 items on an entree menu and, you know, sorry, Josh, you can't figure out what you want to eat, so you want to try a piece <laughs> of everything. Um, Single you know, if you if, There's merit to it in a small version somehow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I just, uh, as a business owner, small mom and pops are going to laugh at you. Yeah, Peter, you are truly an ideas and not a logistics man. I'll give you that. But I will say, claiming someone's plate, no. Uh, that's uh, okay. That's a health I, food violation, but, but like, I'm in. But like, whatever. Just go like, just close your eyes and do it. I've eaten sushi <laughs> off of a neighboring table's plate because they left a whole roll and I had been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I just oh was my it god, raw fish? was it raw fish? Yeah, it was raw fish. Well, if I would have waited any longer, it would have gotten warm. All right, next, opinion. next opinion, please. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. <laughs> my I'm not goodness. Proud of that moment. You know, I wouldn't. You said that on live air. I know. Listen, I like this. You said so much stuff myself. on live air. It humanizes me to them. You know, they're like, oh, he's just like me, a gross piece of crap. <laughs> yeah, nice. you do it for the people. Thanks. Man of the people. It takes one for the team. I like this. Hi, Josh and Nicole. My name is Julie. I'm in Boston. First time caller, long time listener. Hey, Julie. Um, my controversial restaurant take is that eating at the bar stinks. I need elbow mm, room. Yes. I need space to spread out. If I'm eating at the bar, most likely there are people on either side of me. It's tight. Um, I'm, the bartender is watching me eat, which <laughs> makes me very uncomfortable. You can talk I, to them. Even though like, they could watch me eat if I'm at a table, I like to keep my distance. Um, so what are your takes? Are you pro eating at the bar? Are you again seeing mm. at a bar? Mm. Let me know. Love the show. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Julie. So tell us, Robert, what do you feel? I like to be served. I like to be mm. like like pampered. <laughs> I don't look like a. I look like <laughs> the pampered too. chef. <laughs> I like, like, I'm like you, Julie. I don't. I'm not a big sitter at the bar and eating because um, I don't want this. Hang on. I don't, I don't want people yeah. pushing me either yeah. side. Um, I'd rather sit at the table on my own or with, with folks and, and get served. I, I just think that we go to eat to have an experience. That's right. Um, and being pushed and, and by the way, I'm not a female, so I'm not being <laughs> stared at like you yeah, are. Yeah, so I'm true. sorry for that. Um, but no, I'm, I'm definitely a table guy. Interesting. I have a lot of it. No, you go. You go. I'll go. You know how so I feel about I'm this. left-handed, which <laughs> I means I eat like this. <laughs> And I'm very annoying to sit next to, like, like at a booth or like at a at a bar. So I like to sit at a table where I'm not around people as well. Aside from that, it's just I don't know. A bar's for drinking and maybe like getting a fry. But mm-hmm. whenever it's like a fork and knife or like a spoon situation, it's just out the window. I can't do that. It doesn't make sense for me. Justin, we can go out drinking with her. Yeah. Woo! I can I, like I can DD. Like I don't have to drink. I'll wait in the car. I'll keep it running. I can hold um, my own. I love eating at the bar, <laughs> and I love eating in the bar for a very no specific way. reason. No, no, I'll, I'll I'll let you know why. I feel like there was a point, and I think Food Network really brought this along, where the chef was elevated to this rock star status, right? Of course. Okay. And people, it shifted from people wanting to get served in a restaurant, at least in a very specific cadre of LA spots. I'm talking about Father's Office specifically, sure, Chef okay. Sun Yoon. 
um, where they famously just treated customers like crap. They were like, no ketchup, no substitutions. If you ask for ketchup, we'll kick you out. Yeah. It was dark. It was loud. The seats were all communal. There was no backs on any of the stools. You get a splinter on the table, and it was the best burger you'd ever eaten in your freaking life. Kicked off a fancy burger revolution in America. And I grew up sort of idolizing these restaurants. And so for me, I don't want to go to a restaurant and feel served and pampered. I want to go and feel like I'm serving some sort of higher art form by eating a $20 cheeseburger, right? So I love- You hear what he just said? That was like an oxymoron. (laughs) A $20 burger. Well, that's why to me it's so cool because it's something I never had before, right? And without this I can tell by the looks. In my, my, I don't, I just, I just don't think it's worth it. The discomfort is not Mm. worth the nourishment at all. Yeah, me and Julia go on like if we go on an impromptu date night on uh-huh. like a weeknight and we go to a restaurant that's hard to get into, we'll go sit at the bar and absolutely love it. You're you're talking crap with the chefs, you're talking to the bartender, you know, you're you feel like you're part of a community sitting next to other people all enjoying the same thing. I, I love cramped, dark, loud restaurants. And I hate I hate plush sit- sitting in a booth. That's like not what I go to restaurants for. Ugh. But again, it's, it's all about finding. But it, but it depends wants, on you know? depends on the restaurant because you're Definitely. you're you're describing a place. Yes, right? yes I yes, can yes. go to a hole in the wall. I was in a uh, Navajo Nation in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in a restaurant. There was a hole in the wall restaurant. Uh, I fixed it, made great food. I, I, it depends on the people sure. you're with. Food sure. is really, and this is my take on food, it's not necessarily the food you go for. It's the people you spend sure. the time in there that make the difference in that experience or not. Of course. You can have mediocre food and have great people and have the best night drinks ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then you can go to a three-star Michelin, sit with a bunch of boring people, yeah. eat two peas on a plate, uh, and and not be satisfied. You're right. Yeah. So I think, I, I, you know, I'm... With you, I'm not a bar person. Yeah, eight, I like to drink at the bar. Yeah, I like to drink at the bar. <laughs> eight people at an Olive Garden don't want to go to the bar. Well, so, to drink. All so, by shots. the way, two to one, you failed. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Get wrecked. Next opinion, please. My opinion about restaurants is that it's actually cheaper to go out and eat fast food than it is to cook home made meals now. And it's because of inflation. Um, yeah. Intra, we, this is something we were talking about earlier a bit, right? Inflation is killing not only the, the home cooks, it's also killing restaurants. Mm. You know, a, a case of eggs used to be $48. It's now 168 it's Nuts. Right? Um, Horrible. I, I, I just think that the state we are in right now, small businesses are struggling, families are struggling. Mm. It's really interesting. Here's a, here's a figure for you. One in four of our active duty men and women – in our U.S. military, are food insecure. Damn. Right? Horrible. It's a shame. So, and how can you have that in the United States military? It's crazy. But I feel for the folks that, you know, are out trying to take care of their families. And it, and it's I, I see soup kitchens. Um, and I was at Fort, uh, Fort Hood, Texas, mm-hmm. um, giving a 1,000 service members food. You know, uh, Tyson gave me 40 pounds of chicken for a person. Mm-hmm. Um it's tough. Um, it is cheaper to go and get not so good fast food, mm. right, for, for cheap, so at least you get fed. But I would rather, and I, I've been trying to do this for years, a supermarket say, look, and if there's any supermarkets out there listening to this, do it, <laughs> right? I have a section of, of fish and chicken and, and, and uh, um, a protein, vegetables, the recipes in 16 different languages, mm. right? And yeah. the, the the cost of a burger per person. So it could be twenty bucks for a family of four. Yeah. They can afford to do something. Of uh, we're in this we're in this situation right now that it's tough for everybody. It really is. Yeah, and you get these big businesses like say McDonald's, they can keep costs artificially low at least because they're doing everything at such, such a, a high massive scale, scale fifty thousand, yeah. you know, locations yeah. across the yeah. globe. Whereas mom and pop shops can't do that. Um, but I'm curious to see how the grocery store industry is going to overhaul itself in the future. Mm. There were a couple of places that really tried a chain called Fresh and Easy where there were damn near no employees in the store. Everything was automated. They had great fresh produce, great fresh meat, and it was mm. cheap as heck. And then they just went under. I don't know if they got bought out by a bigger company, mm. but I think something needs to be done. You're seeing grocery stores. Well, the labor, the, here's the thing. I, I just partnered with a technology company for the mm. same reason. Labor right now... Whether you're in a supermarket, whether you're in a restaurant, obviously people have to do things, right? Mm-hmm. But if you if you look at 
McDonald's or, or Chipotle, they have machines flipping burgers and yeah, making chips course. and right. So uh, is that the future? Certain jobs, yes. Not every job can mm -hmm. be done by that, yeah. but but you know, technology is is taking over because. In the mundane jobs, remember when I grew up, I'm 57 years old, little like your dad, right? Literally, there was maybe. There wasn't any, there was no jobs as such other than these mundane cooks and dead da, da, da right? Mm -hmm. You come to LA, everybody wants to be an actor. They go to a restaurant to be a server, or they used to. Yeah. Now they don't need to do that. They can mm -hmm. do whatever else. Do so I think it's yeah. changed dramatically. Yeah. Uh, I would jump at a job to serve. I'd be really bad at serving. Uh, I'm not good. I'd be spill everything over you, and I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I got weak wrists. Could never be a server. <laughs> uh, one more opinion. One more? Let's do it. Let's one, more. one more. Yo, what's up? This is Molly. Um, Molly? I'm a little um, high, so I thought it would be a good idea hey. to call. And my controversial restaurant opinion is that Macaroni Grill is a <laughs> stellar restaurant, <laughs> and their best dish is their children's macaroni and cheese. Uh, hmm. Every day. Oh, macaroni Anyways, that grill. was it. Short and sweet. Peace out. <laughs> Sounds like she had a great night. Yeah, I've never been to Macaroni Grill. I've only been Me, once. Uh, nor have I. None of us. No. I, okay, I can only go off my one experience. I will say there's a couple big chain Italian restaurants that I love. Buca di Beppo, I think, does a great job. Yeah. Uh, um, what's the other one? Maggiano's Little Italy. The old spaghetti factory. Giant, <laughs> giant family style portions. Great. My one experience at Macaroni Grill was on prom. It not going where you think it's going. They Aww. spilled straight up. My my uh, date got the penne arrabbiata, right? The spicy sauce. And the, the cook must have spilled a half a bottle of crushed red pepper. Holy in her pasta. And I see this and I, you know, knew enough to know that's not right. And she takes one bite and is crunching through crushed red pepper. And she's like, mm, it's good. And I'm like, hey, no, like I really am against sending dishes back. But this, you have to send this back. Yeah. And she just didn't want to raise a fuss. And so she ate like half this thing of pasta. And, and then, then melted. And then was just, yeah, itchy and uncomfortable. Poor and girl. then she was hungry at the dance. And Tess McCarthy, if you're out there listening to this. Uh, was she your date? I'm sorry. What? Was and Tess your date? Well, she, yeah. dumped, she dumped him after that. Aww. It was a mutual. Tess. Nah, come on now. Come on. You know, yeah, I cried Tess. in my car a little bit, but, you know, we, we make up for it. <laughs> and, he, and he blamed the cook. <laughs> of course. So children's macaroni and cheese. Best thing on the menu? Probably. Right. Listen, <laughs> listen, kids' menus, it's comfort food. It hits sometimes. All right, Robert, thank you so much for joining us, man. Um, again, if you want to invest in a restaurant, but I'm, I'm dead serious about the pop-up. I would do love the pop -up. to do that. I don't want to invest in a restaurant. <laughs> We're at, uh, please, tell, tell the people about your book. Tell the people about what you got coming up. It's the best book that you'll ever have. Talks about empathetic leadership, talks about losing egos and your own, mm. and it talks about, you know, uh, trust. Um, lots of great information for families as well as uh, businesses, but it's also um, a time where I, I thank our military for the service their families are sent behind them. You know, you're doing a great service for all all the listeners. You don't. It doesn't have to cost money to help people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be opening the car door, helping somebody across the road, giving them hug, somebody a hug if they say it's okay. Um, we all buy food at supermarkets, mm -hmm. and we see that more and more the food going. Um, through the cash register then push to the side if you can afford to buy it please do so it could be for a child that's not being fed mm. you know at the end of the day it's up to us collectively to say look I know you all do great things for people you know mm. how about doing one good thing a day for people that you don't know yeah. collectively if we all did that our world would be a better place lots of restaurant impossible coming up um, lots of new stuff happening um, yeah it's just uh Business as usual. Uh, I'm going to get you to eat more food. I'm, I'm committed. You I'm more. dead serious. I'm committed to gaining 15 pounds. 15. I can give you 15. I'll give you four weeks. You put 15 four pounds. Weeks. Four weeks, I'll get 15 pounds. I love that one of your plugs is just for um, altruism. That's beautiful. In, in morality and being a good person. Very nice. We also support that. Yes. We just didn't say it as eloquently as yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> ah, we all do. We all want to do the same thing. We do sure. want to put on this planet, help people, give information, and have fun doing it. You have a lot of fun. So do I. When we do the pop-up, I'm going to teach you an awful lot of business lessons. You're going to come back and you go, oh, my God, that Robert Irvine, what a taskmaster. <laughs> ah, I'm so 
like oh, something excited. like that. And I can't wait for in four years to you come and rescue the failing mythical kitchen on Restaurant Impossible. Heck It'll be full yeah. circle. And thank you all for uh, listening to the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done that yet. Subscribe to Spotify. We're also over on YouTube at Mythical Kitchen. Check us out. We launch new videos every week. And again, Robert, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys. Cheers. Go out. Mythical Kitchen. Let's go. Hurry up. <laughs>